habitats are along the west coast of the United States, especially those where campers would come close to shore. That started in Santa Barbara County, and that was the beginning of a monitoring program that I got uh, associated with right, right away. We never thought much about this. We went out and we monitored every year, we wrote our reports and everything, and then at some point we started having little oil spills all along the west coast of the United States. So there was a oil spill that I banned for Air Force Base, which was called the Torch Oil Spill. There have been two recent ones up in San Francisco Bay, Costa Busan, and Dubai Star. More recently, there's been another smaller one in Alaska, and obviously the one on the East Coast and the Coast. Each time, you get these calls, and they say, you've got to get out to the field right away. You've got to start doing assessments. In the recent oil spills and the recent damages that have occurred, there has been another question that has started to be asked. This is really the focus of the underlying, or the underlying basis of Christmas work. And that question is, it's a question of the dogma that has been in the intertidal in particular literature for a long time, and especially in intertidal policy as it relates to damages, and that is don't intervene. Things will recover on their own following damages. The basis of her work is really a questioning of that underlying basis, and that is, is it always the case that in certain types of habitats we should not intervene? Because if you leave it alone, there will be a response. She's taken a particular system that is a muscle system um, that has been scored in the past, and it shows this ability to respond quickly in some places and to be prolonged delay in other places with respect to the recovery. And what she's going to be doing is what she is proposing to do is to evaluate the muscle system to see whether there is, well, this is a like C muscle, to see whether there are approaches for intervention, to look at the mechanisms for intervention, and to ask the fundamental question as to whether intervention should be proposed, proposed and implemented, or in most cases, when it would not be such a good idea. And so in that case, she's my first student that's ever ventured into what would normally be more of an EBS type thesis, where there is going to be a, a third chapter that's going to be associated with this, that is going to look at possibly predicting or modeling when you should actually do something, rather than just assessing whether something happens. So that offers a Thanks, Pete. Um, so before I get into all that stuff about restoration, I just want to give you a little background on uh, some of the ideas, the ecological ideas behind the work that I'm going to be doing. And so stu the study of species interactions is a, a really fundamental part of the field of ecology. And species interactions can be negative and they can be positive. And our focus on these two types of uh, interactions has really gone back and forth over the years. And so uh, early on, in, uh, ecologists uh, focused a lot on uh, positive interactions or facilitation where at least one species benefits and another are harmed. And their focus on these interactions was due to their importance, the important role they play in successional dynamics. But then over the next 50 years, the pendulum really swung back the other way. And the uh, uh, focus of most ecologists was on the role of negative interactions in uh, ecological systems. And so things like predation and competition were studied quite frequently. And because of that, uh, the ecological theory that we have developed um, during that time is really focused on uh, these negative interactions and kind of overlooks uh, the role that positive interactions can play in communities. But over the last 20 years, this pendulum has started to kind of swing back. And that began with some of these in, important papers by Bert Ness and Calloway in 1994, and then by others in the early 2000s that argued that positive interactions are, are occurring in nature and, they're likely, and they likely play an important role in ecological communities. And so they warranted our uh, consideration. And the studies that have been done since then have shown that facilitation does play a really important role. And it can affect uh, population dynamics, community composition, species diversity, and even ecosystem function. But there's really a, a lot of catching up to do that, that we need to do in order to better understand positive interactions. And one of the uh, remaining questions is where and when are positive interactions most important? Um, so <clears throat> one idea is that positive interactions are more important in stressful environments. And so here I'm defining stress as this very broad idea. Stress can be the physiological, physical, or even biological from things like predation, competition, or disease. And um, in this sense, uh, positive interactions benefit individuals by reducing these stressors. 
And so there are a lot of examples of this in uh, uh, desert and alpine environments where uh, plants can re by provide shade or reduce uh, water or wind stress. And by doing that, they benefit the plants that associate with them by increasing their survival growth or their reproductive capability. Now, there are fewer examples of uh, positive interactions in marine environments, but one place where um, uh, facilitation is known to be important is in the, the rocky intertidal. And so the rocky intertidal is an extremely stressful place, as anyone knows who's been out there. Um, there's a lot of abiotic stress from, from waves, wind, um, desiccation stress, and then there's a lot of biotic stress from the, uh, a large num number of predators and a lot of competition. <laughs> However, there's also this complex habitat that exists there that can potentially ameliorate these stresses. So um, <clears throat> one of these complex habitats is formed by the muscle Middleus californianus. And Middleus californianus is one of the most abundant primary space holders along the uh, rocky coast of the East Pacific. And it plays a really important ecological role here. Uh, as a filter feeder, it's also an important prey item for birds, fish, and other invertebrates. And then it also provides this uh, complex habitat through the formation of their shells and by laying down these thistle threads that you can see right here um, to attach to the rock. <coughs> and what I find really interesting about uh, this muscle is that it can both be a benefactor and a beneficiary in these uh, positive interactions. So as adults, these muscles facilitate a diverse community of, uh, of inverts and algae, and this uh, in turn <coughs> supports the uh, structure of the muscle bed community. However, as juveniles, other species that like filamentous algae or barnacle shells and the visible threads of, of adult muscles help to facilitate the settlement of muscle recruits. And so that also helps to maintain the muscle bed community. And I'm interested in exploring these interactions, not only because I think it will help us to under, better understand the role of positive interactions in muscle beds, but also um, because of their, as Pete mentioned, their the potential to be able to actually harness these interactions and uh, <coughs> help to restore systems that have been disturbed um, <coughs> by human activity. And so uh, human disturbance is increasingly becoming a problem in the Rocky Intertidal. Um, we all know about oil spills, but then there's also coastal development, uh, marine debris and shipwrecks that can dislodge uh, large areas of, of uh, animals. And then also just human use of collection and trampling by humans visiting the intertidal. And so um, as these pressures increase, I think it becomes more and more important to understand the kinds of uh, interactions uh, that can potentially mitigate their effects. And so my main objectives for my dissertation are first to explore the role of mussels as ecosystem engineers and understand how they can help with the recovery of rocky intertidal mussel beds. And then in my second chapter, I'm going to rewind a little bit and look at the role that uh, facilitation plays in the recruitment of these mussels, and particularly how this might vary across stress gradients and throughout post-settlement growth. And then in my third chapter, I'm going to really focus in on uh, what we, has already been mentioned, this potential for restoration strategies to be used in the Rocky Intertidal and create a framework for evaluating when intervention might actually be uh, advisable. So moving into chapter one, um, ecosystem engineers uh, create, maintain, or modify uh, habitat. And by doing this, they uh, modulate the availability of resources to other species. And so uh, engineers can be either autogenic or allogenic. So if they're autogenic, then they create this habitat through their own biological structure. So things like trees within a forest or coral reefs. Um, engineers can also be allogenic. And in that case, they create this habitat by modifying other biotic or abiotic material. And the classic example of that is the beaver. So mussels are autogenic engineers, and they create this structural change by uh, forming shells and by laying down bissel threads. And then this structural change can create both uh, can create biotic change either directly or indirectly. So directly, mussels create biotic change by providing a place for attachment and by potentially uh, reducing the ability of predators to forage, which benefits the species that associate with them. 
And then indirectly, the structural change can create abiotic change. So for example, increased moisture within a muscle bed or decreased water flow would reduce um, wave stress. And this abiotic change can then create a biotic change by providing more hospitable habitat for species that associate with muscle beds. And then all of these changes can actually feed back to the engineer. And there's a lot of ways that that can, actually, that can happen. But um, one interesting way is that these um, habitats created by adult mussels uh, create a more suitable environment for their recruits to settle within. And so you can get what's called a recruitment cascade where adults facilitate recruits, which grow up to be adults, which facilitate more recruits. And so you can have this rapid maintenance of the muscle bed um, in that way. And so because uh, engineers can uh, create both abiotic and biotic change within the environment, um, it's been suggested that they could play a really important role in recovery. And particularly, it's been suggested that they could be used for restoration purposes. And so there's a lot of ways they could benefit restoration. And one way is that they could uh, speed up the natural recovery dynamics by, uh, by jumping ahead a few steps in the successional chain. And then another way is they can actually lower the threshold necessary to push uh, a system that's been disturbed back towards the more desirable state. And so um, to demonstrate that this is just a simple ball and cup uh, uh, figure, which shows a system where um, the, in the green there's a, the desired state and in the red is the current state. And in the top frame you can see that there's a, a big hump for the system to get over to to get back towards that desired state. And, but adding a desirable engineer can actually lower that threshold and, and lower that, um, that push that you need to be able to get back towards, um, towards that green state there. However, um, engineers don't necessarily have to do this. They could also um, change the environment in a way that would make that hump even steeper to get over. So understanding the role that engineers play and how they might affect recovery is really important. So my first question is, to determine if muscle transplants could speed up the recovery rate of muscle bed communities. And I think that they could do this in two ways. They could either, they can facilitate the uh, invertebrate and algal community that associate with muscle beds, and then they could also uh, speed up recovery by creating this recruitment cascade that I mentioned before. And then my second question has to do with a specific characteristic of the engineer. So things like size and density can affect the role that engineers play within the environment. And so what I wanted to look at was if the patchiness of muscle aggregations would affect its ability to influence recovery. And so what I'm talking about here is not changing the cover of the muscle, keeping the cover, uh, cover of muscles the same, but changing the level of patchiness. And so the idea would be that increased patchiness could increase perimeter area um, there in red, and that could potentially uh, uh, magnify the effect of the uh, engineers on recovery by creating more places for settlement. Um, it could also decrease the positive effect of these engineers on recovery if um, it limits the ability of this, the engineer uh, to modify the environment. So say if you're talking about wave pressure, it may be better to actually have a larger clump of muscles. And so I wanted to, to test this. And so to do that, I, I had two sites at Vandenberg Air Force Base, Oculto and Pothole. <coughs> and at each site, there were uh, muscle transplants that had been placed into cleared plots, that, thick plots that were cleared with a wire brush. And so there were four different plot types. There was the two transplant treatments, one with a uh, one patch of 100 muscles, and then another uh, plot with uh, three patches that which sum to 100 muscles. And then there was a clear plot that uh, mimicked a situation where there was a disturbance and then no engineer was present, and then a control plot, which was just natural muscle bed. And I had four replicates of each of these plots at each site, so four replicate blocks for a total of 16 plots at each site. And I wanted to compare the community composition of these plots over time. And so I, uh, at each sampling in interval, which was monthly for about the first year and a half and then quarterly after that, I estimated percent cover and I used a 100 point grid. And at each point, I ID'd uh, what was there to the lowest taxonomic level possible. And then I also measured two other factors that are um, important in the intertidal and likely would affect recovery. And so I measured uh, the muscle recruitment, and I did that by both uh, measuring artificial recruitment, or I measured it on artificial substrate, 
um, these toughy dish scrubbers. And then I also measured uh, uh, recruitment, the natural recruitment that I was seeing within the plots. And then I measured uh, the uh, effect of predators by counting the abundance and size of uh, two common muscle predators, the predatory whelk mucella, and I counted those within the plot, and then the sea star pisaster within a one meter radius of each plot. And so to answer the question, do muscle transplants speed up the recovery of um, muscle bed communities, I compared the community composition of these plots using the percent cover data. And so my raw data looked like this, where I had a list of species and then um, the number of times that I saw each um, in, the, in the plots at each sampling interval. And then I used primer to generate this Gray-Curtis similarity matrix. And what this does is it takes the species composition for one plot and compares it to the species composition of another plot, and it assigns it a similarity value, which ranges from 100 to 0. So 100 would be 100% similarity would mean that the two plots had identical species composition. And then I, I looked at those similarity values and, and generated a cluster analysis to compare the similarities of, of these uh, plot types. And so what I saw at Popple, um, that this uh, figure here is, is similar to a phylogenetic tree where the, the branches show relationships between plot types. And so what's important to look at is the, uh, the branch length. So longer branch lengths mean uh, plots are less similar and shorter branch lengths mean plots are more similar. And so at Pothole, over the 22-month 22 22 period, you can see that the transplant plots become increasingly similar to the control plots over time. And that the cleared plots do not, so they, they remain uh, 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 distant. So it appears that uh, the presence of muscle transplants is actually helping to speed up the recovery of, uh, of plots, at, at least at Pothole. Now the same pattern isn't observed at a culto. That they don't. The uh, transplant plots still group out with the cleared plots, <clears throat> and that may just be because of the differences between these two sites. So you can see here in the purple, um, the natural muscle cover at these two sites is very different, and so at a culto it's much higher. And so there's just a, a longer way to go for these plots to reach recovery, and I think it's just going to take more time, and, and luckily I have more time to continue to watch the recovery of these plots. Uh, another important thing to, uh, to notice here is that the muscle cover in the transplant plots did not increase over uh, this study period so far. So um, one of the ways that I thought uh, transplants would speed up recovery was by facilitating recruitment. And so far it doesn't seem that any uh, re recruitment that's occurred because of the presence of these muscle transplants has has translated into increased muscle cover. However, the, the plots are still, uh, at least at pothole, becoming more similar to the control plots. And so that's likely due to um, the increase in similarity in the in, invertebrate and algal community that's settling with uh, the muscle transplant. But I wanted to look more directly at that and sort of eliminate this inherent bias set up by the experiment, and that being that the transplant plots already have more points of muscles because they have muscle transplants, and then the clear plots have many more points of rock because they're clear. And so I wanted to, uh, eliminate, uh, to, to eliminate that bias, and so what I did was I removed all the points of rock and muscle from my percent cover data. And that allowed me to just directly compare the invertebrate and algal community that's associated um, with those plots and look directly at that and compare those, uh, the community composition of, of that community um, between plot types. And so I generated another Ray Curtis similarity matrix with this data, and then um, plotted the similarity values over time. And so I have uh, transplant plots here in orange, and the cleared plots in blue, and the similarity values are plotted between the, those plots and the control plots. And so what I see at Pothole is that the, the invertebrate and algal community is becoming more and more similar to the control plot, and at a faster rate than the cleared plots. And so it seems that um, that's exactly the case, that the transplants are helping to facilitate the invertebrate and algal community. And at Oculto, it's a little bit different. The, the transplant plots are, seem to have a, an initial boost from the presence of adult muscles, but then it seems like the similarity to the controls actually declines over time. And I think, again, this is just due to the difference between these two sites and the muscle dominance there. So um, the control plots are really dominated by muscles, and so some of the decline in similarity may be that the uh, the uh, 
those plots are actually increasing in species diversity beyond uh, the control plot. And so again, I think it will just be uh, more time to observe these recovery dynamics. They just may be more complicated. And so as far as my second question, does muscle patchiness affect recovery? Um, so far, I haven't seen any difference. So the community composition between these two plot types at both sites is not statistically different. And so, at least in this case, uh, patchiness does not seem to affect the ability of these engineers to speed up recovery. And so to summarize, what I've seen so far is that muscle transplants can speed up recovery, and they're doing this by um, increasing uh, the, facil or by facilitating invertebrate in the invertebrate and apple community. But that this uh, engineering effect is, is really variable. And so in the future, I want to uh, continue to process the recruitment data that I've collected and incorporate that in the predation data along with some measures of, of some of the abiotic factors at these two different sites to see how those factors might be influencing some of this variability. So moving on to chapter two. Um, Realizing this uh, important role that adult mussels play within rocky intertidal uh, habitats, I wanted to uh, rewind a little bit and, and look at how mussels themselves are, are uh, facilitated. And so for my second chapter, I'm going to be exploring the role of facilitation in the recruitment of Middle East Californianus. And so I'm defining recruitment here as the first observation of a settler by an investigator. And so this is really a measure of both settlement and post-settlement mortality. And recruitment is a really important uh, life history stage for most rocky intertidal populations. And that's because the most rocky intertidal populations are open. And so they rely on the input of larvae from outside the system to replenish the population. And so it's really important to identify the factors that determine recruitment success. And so as I started thinking about this, I wanted to know what we know so far about muscle recruitment. And so muscles have this typical bipartite life history, whereas adults, they're on shore, and then they have a pelagic larvae that settle back onto the shore after a certain period. And so this recruitment period right here, settlement and, and, and early post-settlement mortality, um, is what I really wanted to know about. And in particular, I wanted to know what they were settling on. And what we know so far is that, uh, that mussels don't tend to be found settled on bare rock. And so they're considered to be poor settlers of bare rock. And they are often found on filamentous substrate, usually the bissel threads of adult mussels, but then also a lot of other filamentous algae and on barnacle shells. And it's assumed that there's some benefit from settling on this. These uh, filamentous substrates, but that's never actually been directly tested. And even if it's really obvious that there's some positive effect of uh, this filamentous substrate on muscle recruits, I think there's a lot of really interesting questions about that that haven't been explored. Like, you know, how do different uh, substrates compare? You know, is an adult muscle a better facilitator than, say, a filamentous algae like endocladia? And how would those interactions vary in space and time? <laughs> And so, as I mentioned before, positive interactions are predicted to be important in the uh, in more stressful environments. And this has been conceptualized in the stress gradient hypothesis, which was proposed by Burtness and Callaway. And so, what, what basically what the stress gradient hypothesis says is that with increasing stress, you're going to have increasing frequency of positive interactions. And so, um, and then in more benign environments, you have um, increasing frequency of competitive interactions. So there's two uh, different uh, gradients of stress here. That with increasing physical stress, um, you get uh, increasing positive interactions due to neighborhood habitat amelioration. And so a really good example of this, or a classic example, is uh, nurse plants. And so nurse plants uh, can create shade. They can uh, increase water content within the soil. And they benefit uh, the species that associate with them because of that, by reducing these abiotic stressors. And then along this other gradient of stress, you have increasing consumer pressure. And so um, it's predicted that you'll have increased, with this increasing stress, you'll have increasing positive interactions due to associational defenses. And there's fewer examples of that, but the, the, this is a, one really good one, where um, palatable algae that associate and settle with um, unpalatable chemically, chemically defended algae actually have experienced reduced herbivory from fishes, and so they benefit from that association in that way. 
So the stress gradient hypothesis, particularly in plant uh, uh, facilitation studies, has been uh, hotly debated over time. It's gone back and forth whether this uh, hypothesis is really uh, could be applied generally. And in, even at, as recently as a few weeks ago, there was a paper published on this topic. Um, but this argument has, has really benefited the plant facilitation uh, ecologists because it, um, <clears throat> it has a, a, a helped to create this framework for thinking about the role of positive interactions uh, in these environments. And it's also identified a lot of other factors that might be important to predicting positive interactions. And one of those is ontogeny, which I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, but in marine environments, it's, uh, especially in marine facilitation studies, it's a lot less common to talk about positive interactions in this context. And so uh, I think that's really a missed opportunity. And so for this chapter, what I want to do is first determine what species recruiting mussels positively associate with in uh, Central California mussel beds, and then determine how those recruit neighbor interactions vary across stress gradients, and then um, determine if there's any evidence that these recruit neighbor interactions vary due to ontogeny. So throughout post-settlement growth, um, as uh, recruit goes from being very small to being larger, how do those interactions change? And specifically, I want to see if recruit size distributions vary as a function of facilitator species. So recruitment is a really important life history stage to study, but it's also extremely challenging to study. So muscle recruits are really small. They settle within complex habitat. They are also cryptic, so they're difficult to ID to species when they're really small. They uh, are distributed really casually within the environment. And probably worst of all, they're able to, uh, to move around a little bit. <laughs> so they can be difficult to track. And they're even hard to take pictures of. So I don't know if you can see the recruit in this picture. It's right there next to the metal washer <laughs> settled at the base of the uh, pelvic chiasis. But I'm not going to be deterred, and I want to continue with uh, <laughs> my, uh, my questions. And I have a couple, uh, three sets of studies that I want to do to kind of explore this interaction. And so for my first question, um, what species do mussel recruits associate with? I'm predicting that they're going to associate with, um, pos positively associate with its habitat forming species, especially filamentous algae, the shells of um, barnacles, and then some canopy and folios uh, algae. <coughs> However, there may also be negative associations with canopy and forming algae, and um, it really just depends on the structure of the fronds, I think. So um, these heavier fronds that whip around with wave action can actually dislodge recruits. And so in that case, those algaes would um, have a negative association with muscle recruits. And then, of course, uh, there would be a negative association with rock. And so to, to look at this, I'm going to be doing surveys at high, middle, and low. Uh, tidal heights within the muscle zone. And then along each transect, I'm using uh, 50 by 50 centimeter quadrats to make uh, observations of recruits. And the reason I'm doing it this way is <clears throat> because, as I mentioned, it's really, it can be really challenging to find recruits within the environment. And they also can be really patchily distributed. And so I was concerned about um, getting enough observations and making sure that those observations were independent. And so I think that this, this approach will help to uh, accomplish that goal. And so within each uh, quadrat, I make two observations of recruits. And I'm doing this randomly in order to reduce my own bias about where I think I would find recruits. I, I didn't want to bias my observations in that way. So what I've been doing is dropping an object within the plot and then um, searching within a radius around that <laughs> plot until I find a recruit. Um, and then uh, once I find the recruit, I record the settlement substrate, its size, and then also the number of associated recruits. So sometimes they settle on their own, but then other times you find them in these clumps with a bunch of other recruits, and I wanted to account for that. And so once I've made all of the observations that I can make of the recruits, I go back along that, that same transect and um, using uniform point contact methods, um, estimate the natural substrate cover in that area. And so what I end up with is data that look like this, like this with a, a list of uh, substrates. And then I have the number of times I observed that substrate as a recruit substrate, and the number of times I observed it just naturally, um, its natural cover within the environment. And then I'm, I can use a chi-square test to determine if the recruit substrate is significantly different from what you would expect based on its natural substrate cover. 
And so I've done a few of these surveys already. So this is a, a data from a, a survey I did at Terrace Point right here at the Green Lab. And what I found was actually really interesting. I found that the uh, settlement substrate of muscle recruits was significantly different from what you would expect based on natural preference. So recruits are not just going out and settling on what's there. They um, are definitely have, there's definitely positive and negative associations. So what I did was for recruit substrates, I plotted the standard deviate, which would just indicate the direction of these associations. And this was even more interesting, because what I saw was that um, recruits had this really significantly uh, positive association with pelvisiopsis, both settling at the base and under the canopy of this algae. And I didn't really expect to see that, because I thought that this would be one of those uh, canopy forming algaes that would just whip around and, and knock off recruits. And so that's actually um, really surprising. The other thing I saw was that um, the acorn barnacles, Phalanus and Phamilus, had a slightly negative effect on, on muscle recruits. Um, however, when that barnacles are paired with an algal canopy, they actually have a slightly positive effect. And that's really interesting because a lot of the algal canopy was actually mastocarpus, which also has a slightly neutral or negative effect on muscle recruits. So alone, each of these things have a negative effect, but then when put together, it becomes positive. And so uh, I'm really interested to continue to do this and to, uh, to look for these kind of uh, possible combinations of things that would facilitate recruits. So moving on to my second question, I want to go beyond just looking at associations and look directly at the interactions um, between recruits and their uh, facilitators or neighbors. Um, and I want to see how these interactions vary across stress gradients. And so there are these two main stress gradients um, in the intertidal, um, an abiotic stress gradient that increases uh, with tidal height, and then a biotic stress gradient that increases with decreasing tidal height. And so I'm predicting that um, positive interactions will vary according to the stress gradient hypothesis. So at the upper end of the muscle band where you have stress from heat, desiccation, and submersion time, you'd have positive interactions due to habitat amelioration. And then at the other end, <coughs> where you have increasing biotic stress due to predation, you'd have uh, positive interactions due to associational defenses. And then in the middle of the muscle zone, you'd have either mutual or negative interactions with neighbors. And there's two ways that I can see this that you detecting this increase in positive interactions. And that could be a complete shift from negative to positive, or you could also see a, just a reduction in competition. So going from negative to less negative with increasing stress. And so the first thing I'm going to do is go out and actually measure these stress gradients and evaluate them uh, relative to the recruits. And so I'll measure abiotic stress using temperature and light loggers, and then I'll measure biotic stress using uh, by comparing caged and uncaged areas to estimate the likelihood of a predation event. And then I'm going to create this sort of pseudo neighbor removal experiment. So typically what people do in these experiments is they'll go out and actually remove the neighbor and then compare an individual with the neighbor to one without. But I can't actually remove neighbors without also dislodging the muscle recruits. And so I'm going to have to kind of manufacture this on uh, natural substrate tiles. But what I'm going to do is attach uh, recruits and then uh, pair them with neighbors and without neighbors and, and compare them. So I'll have these three tile types. I, um, I want to evaluate two different neighbors. And so one I think will be adult mussels. And then the second neighbor will be um, probably a filamentous algae, but it will depend on what I find in my uh, initial recruit surveys. <coughs> and then I'll have a tile of recruits without any neighbors. And then I'll have a second set of tiles that are caged. And this is just to enable me to actually uh, decouple these two different stresses, the abiotic stress and the biotic stress. So these case treatments will eliminate the biotic stress and allow me to look directly at the effect of neighbors on reducing abiotic stress. And then I'll have three replicates of these uh, tiles at, at low, middle, and high tidal heights within the muscle zone. And then so I'll measure the survival and growth of the recruits on these tiles, and then I can compare um, the survival and growth of recruits with and without neighbors and calculate a relative interaction index. And this relative interaction index uh, varies from one to negative one, one being uh, complete facilitation and negative one being competition. And so by comparing these, uh, comparing uh, 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 recruits with neighbors and without neighbors, I can uh, estimate the net positive effect of uh, the neighbor on recruits. And by comparing the cage treatments, I can uh, 
determine the positive effect of the neighbor due to abiotic stress reduction. And so if, if I find results that agree with the stress grading hypothesis, I'm expecting them to look kind of like this. So you have the relative interaction index here on the, on the y-axis. And then uh, I would see with these unhaged treatments where I'm looking at the net positive effect, I see um, a positive effect of neighbors at low and high tidal heights due to stress. And then at mid-tidal heights within the muscle zone, there would be a neutral or negative effect of neighbors. And then when I eliminate the biotic stress, um, you'd end up seeing uh, something like this, where, um, where biotic stress is uh, the, the major form of stress at the low tidal end. You, uh, once you eliminate that, there would be a negative effect of neighbors. Same thing at uh, mid-tidal heights. And then at the high tidal height within the muscle zone, where the majority of stress is abiotic, I'm predicting that there'd still be a um, positive effect of neighbors, even with the cage treatment. And so moving on to my last question, I wanted to look and see how recruit size distributions might vary as a function of facilitator species. And so um, there are uh, a couple ways this could play out. Recruits might actually vary in their sensitivity to stresses over time, or neighbors may vary in their facilitative capability. So there's some evidence of this with uh, the muscle perna perna in South Africa, um, where they've seen uh, evidence that suggests that uh, filamentous algae really only has a positive effect on recruits when they're very small, and then as they get larger, um, this positive effect is reduced. <clears throat> and so I wanted to see if there was any evidence for that. Um, and I'm predicting that there will be more small recruits than large recruits on, on filamentous algae, um, just based on some of the observations I've done here. And this could either be due to differences in survival, or it could be differences due to habitat usage. Um, so I mentioned that recruits are capable of small-scale movements. So they may just be, as they reach a certain size, moving into a better habitat. Um, and I realize that these are two really different outcomes, but um, it is difficult to kind of to look directly at whether they're just dying or whether they're moving somewhere else. But I'll talk a little bit later about a way I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to, to get at that. And so to do this, what I'm going to do is go out and make clearings within algal facilitators and adult muscle facilitators, and then collect that and bring it to the lab and measure um, the abundance and size of the recruits within those uh, clearings. <clears throat> and then I'll have five replicates of those at uh, mid, low, and high uh, tidal heights within the muscle zone. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned, it's really difficult to, to look at these uh, recruits and see if they're moving and see how they're growing. <coughs> And so um, one possible solution that I'm looking into right now is um, using calcine marking. So calcine is a fluorochrome, and it binds to calcium and can be incorporated into growing calcium carbonate structures. And so it's, it's used in a lot of different applications. You can see in the photos here, it creates this distinct band that's visible under blue light. And you can use it to, um, to identify in individuals that you've marked and also to measure the growth since the time uh, of exposure because you get this really distinct band. And it's a completely non-invasive method. You can uh, just uh, submerge uh, individuals in a calcium bath to mark them. And it's also non-toxic. So I think this could be a really great way for me to, um, in a lot of these studies, to be able to measure growth of recruits and also to mark the individuals so I know that I'm, what I'm looking at is, is what I've been looking at all along and it just hasn't moved. And then there's also the possibility, uh, most of the time, uh, when this technique is used, uh, invertebrates are just collected and brought back to the lab, and it's, the mark is detected under a microscope. But there are some cases where they um, have a field detector that they use to um, look at the light, and so I'm looking in to see whether it might be possible to actually detect this mark in the field. And if that were the case, then I would actually be able to mark individuals and then potentially see if they are moving out of that area. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be possible, but it would be really cool if it works out, so <laughs> I'll keep you posted. Okay, so moving on to chapter three, I want to kind of switch gears and talk about a lot of um, the, the things, that, the ideas that have sort of motivated the, this previous work, and that's um, the potential for restoration in the Rocky Intertidal. And most of the time when I talk about restoration, people kind of, in the Rocky Intertidal, they kind of give me a funny look and say, well, is that really needed? And I, I think it, it, it might be. Um, so rocky intertidal ecosystems, in some cases, in some cases. So rocky intertidal ecosystems, um, we know, are extremely valuable. 
Um, and because of the accessibility of these habitats, they provide um, a, a great place, of one, and sometimes one of the only places for people to go out and interact with the marine environment. And so it's a, it's a really valuable resource in the sense that it's a, a place where people can actually go out to learn and to uh, understand the value of marine resources. But this location at the coastal interface also makes it really vulnerable to uh, uh, human activity. And so, as Pete mentioned, oil spills are a really big problem. They continue to be. Um, there are 263 spills per year between 2002 and 2004 in U.S. coastal waters. And even a single event can, can cause a lot of problems. So the costco busan spill in San Francisco Bay uh, occurred when a cargo ship struck the uh, Bay Bridge and then leaked 53,000 gallons of oil into San Francisco Bay, which was then dispersed readily outside of the bay. And it ended up oiling 384 acres of rocky intertidal habitat. And then this has a, a lot of negative effects. But um, what's interesting is that this isn't even a very large spill. And so um, uh, these pressures, uh, this kind of pressure uh, can have a lot of negative effects even um, on relatively small scales. <clears throat> Another way that humans can uh, negatively affect the uh, rocky intertidal habitats is just by human use. So this is especially a problem in areas with high coastal populations where you can get a lot of visitors to rocky intertidal. Um, so in Southern California, it's been estimated that there are 50,000 visitors per year along a 100, just a 100 meter stretch of uh, coastline there. Um, and this has a lot of, uh, can, can negatively, negatively affect a lot of the species there. Um, this figure shows uh, mussel cover at high and low human use sites. And what you can see is that across the board, the uh, high human use sites have uh, on average about 20% uh, lower mussel cover. <clears throat> and I think it's really interesting just to know that that's actually natural bridges right there. So um, natural bridges is, is uh, a very heavily used uh, site in the Central Coast. And so <clears throat> recovery after these uh, disturbances is, is pretty, it can be uncertain. And um, it's, it's very variable. And uh, it can depend on a lot of different factors like recruitment and life history. So for mussels, we know from work by Tish Conway Kranos and um, a former RC grad, and the kinetics laboratory studies that uh, mussel beds can take on the order of, of, they can take about a decade or even more to recover. And this is particularly a problem in California where mussel recruitment is uh, an order of magnitude or more lower than um, other areas along the coast, in, like in Oregon. <coughs> And so I think there really is a growing need for rocky intertidal restoration, particularly along California coasts. And there are already are projects being funded. So the settlement money from the costco busan spill, um, some of that was allocated for restoration projects in, in rocky intertidal habitats. And um, the kind of concerning thing about this is that a lot of these decisions are being made on the fly, and there's been no evaluation as to whether um, where, where restoration strategies should be implemented, whether they're going to work. And so I think there really is a need to be able to evaluate these strategies and determine if intervention is the right approach before we go full steam ahead into uh, uh, using restoration. And so one really simple way you can think about making these decisions is just balancing the cost of restoration against the restoration gain. So anytime the cost exceeds the gain, you'd want to do nothing. And if the gain of the restoration exceeds the cost, then you'd want to intervene. And calculating the cost of a restoration project is pretty straightforward, but calculating the restoration gain can be a little more complicated. And it's even more complicated in rocky intertidal habitats because they have the potential to uh, natural, naturally recover over time. And so measuring the gain is actually um, probably going to be scaled by time. <coughs> and so it looks something like this, where you have a system that's been disturbed, and then you can plot natural recovery over time and estimate that the time period it would take to naturally recover. And then you could also compare that to the uh, time it would take to recovery after intervention. And so you can calculate a time saved by intervention by subtracting those two time uh, periods. And uh, it, whenever, the, it, in cases where the time saved is particularly long, you may still uh, benefit from intervention. And so in, in that case, it, still be uh, warranted. But this is this is a really important thing to, to go ahead and look at before uh, making these decisions. 
And so this is uh, kind of just the, the first uh, thing I've been thinking about as far as making these decisions, but I think there's a lot of other questions to answer before we create a uh, decision-making tool. And so some of these factors, I think, are determining who will be making uh, restoration decisions in rocky and tidal habitats. And then also what methods have been used for restoration in other ecosystems. There's plenty of other examples and people are, are making decisions about restoration in other ecosystems that we can likely draw on. And then also I want to determine what factors are important to rocky intertidal muscle beds in order to um, incorporate all of these things into uh, some kind of decision making tool uh, <clears throat> that can then be used to evaluate potential strategies and uh, restoration sites. And so, my final question is to um, determine when and, when and where um, the adult muscle transplant strategy that I talked about in chapter one could be useful. And so for this first question, um, I want to identify and survey potential end users of this tool. And I think this is something I kind of overlooked at first, but I think it's actually a really important part of this process because it really um, ends up determining what the end goal will be. So how I've been thinking about this um, is really in the context of how you would de make decisions about restoration following an oil spill. And so in that case, you'd be, you'd be uh, the end user might be the NRDA. <clears throat> and so they're they evaluate an injury and they're interested in restoring that injury to the best ability possible. Um, but another organization might not be interested in restoring an injury at all. They might be more interested in uh, how, many, how much ecosystem services they could get from a restoration project. And so that is, those are two totally different end goals, and it would it really dictate the structure of how this decision, these decisions would be made. And so I also want to, um, to, to uh, formulate this decision-making tool, I want to review um, what tools have been used in other ecosystems, and then determine the factors that are going to be important to rocky intertidal muscle bed. So recovery time, as I mentioned, is probably going to be a very important factor. So things like recruitment, um, the size of a disturbance and the presence of facilitator species or life history traits are all going to be important factors to consider um, in order to estimate recovery time. And so I want to um, look at some other factors that might be important. <clears throat> and one uh, model that I've looked at so far that's been most appealing is um, something that's used in uh, eelgrass systems where they um, uh, assign a potential transplant suitability index um, to different sites based on their potential for um, uh, transplanting eelgrass. And so in order to do this, they, they, evaluate, they, they assign this rating based on uh, a series of parameters that they know are important to seagrass habitats. So things like uh, wave exposure, water depth. <clears throat> and then um, they've actually incorporated this into a GIS model that you can use for a variety of areas where you know these parameters. And you can estimate where um, sites that would be, have good potential or poor potential for uh, eelgrass transplants. And I think that this could be um, potentially modified for rocky intertidal habitats. And we have a lot of information about um, rocky intertidal sites all along the coast here. And so um, we're a long way from actually getting to this point, but I, I think that this could be um, potentially a great way to, to think about um, restoration, at least in the context of, say, like the NRPA. <clears throat> but so far what I've done is I've been able to um, look at this muscle transplant strategy and, um, and look at um, what I talked about before, this, this uh, time saved. And so um, if you remember this figure from before, these are the similarity values between um, cleared plots and controlled plots and transplant plots and controlled plots. So the blue line basically is representing natural recovery and the orange line is, is representing basically recovery under intervention. And so um, by comparing the difference between uh, these uh, two recovery rates, I was able to calculate the time saved for two different uh, factors, for species identity, so just the presence or absence of, of similar species, and then also community composition, which accounts for uh, the abundance of those species as well. And what I found is that by using uh, muscle transplants, we were able to, you, you could potentially save two and a half years um, in uh, restoring species identity and more than four years in restoring community composition by using this intervention technique. Um, and this is just on the quadrat scale. So we're talking about 50 by 50 centimeter quadrats. And we know from, uh, uh, from studies by, by Tisch and, and others that 
the size of a disturbance, the recovery rates actually scale with the size of disturbance. So the larger the disturbance, the longer it takes to reach recovery. And so um, I think that this could potentially be even more. Um, and it'd be, it'll be interesting to look and, and uh, calculate how this might actually scale up to a, a realistic size of a disturbance. And so I want to continue to build on this and incorporate other factors that would be important to consider in uh, making decisions about using this strategy and then also using all the information we have from the sites um, along the coast here to predict where um, and when muscle, this muscle transplant strategy might actually work and be beneficial. <clears throat> so my take home messages for you today are First, that uh, positive interactions are really a critical component to understanding ecological communities. And so I, I encourage everyone to think about um, how positive interactions might be influencing your systems and um, along with negative interactions, how they might be structuring those systems. And I'm hoping through this work to be able to better understand the role of these positive interactions in muscle bed communities and then also understand how those, um, those interactions might be applied for restoration purposes. But then I also um, realized that before restoration really takes off within the Rocky Inner Tidal, we need a way to be able to evaluate um, whether uh, intervention is really necessary. And so I'm, I'm hoping to create this decision-making tool as, as sort of a, a building block to, to getting to that point. <clears throat> so with that, I just want to thank some people. Um, first, uh, my advisor, Pete. He's amazingly supportive and despite all of the things that he's busy with all the time. He's always available to talk with me and uh, go over my ideas, and I really appreciate that. Um, and I want to thank my comps committee and my uh, proposal committee for uh, challenging me and uh, giving me feedback on this work. I also want to give a big thanks to the Intertidal group here. Um, as someone who had never stepped foot in Rocky Intertidal before I started grad school, I had a huge learning curve, and each and every single one of these people were there to help me um, when I had questions and to teach me um, what I need to be able to do in the field and in the lab. Um, and even taught me how to drive stick. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dan, I'm gonna thank you, thanks for that. <laughs> uh, and uh, I wanna thank my volunteers that helped me in the field and in the lab. And then uh, all the other support that I've received along the way from the RC lab and from the EV and LML staff and uh, my cohort. They're just killing it right now with a proposal per week at this point. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for coming out again. Um, and then also my, my friends and family. Um, my mom and dad, who I think are, are watching my talk right now on the live stream that Patrick is running. So, hi, mom and dad. <laughs> and then, of course, my husband, Matt, who is incredibly supportive all the time and has more than once gotten up at 4 in the morning to go out and collect data with me. So you can't ask for anything better than that. So. <laughs> So I will take any questions. Yeah. You're talking about uh, it's really nice, nicely done, but in terms of trying to. The intervention or no intervention, I was involved in the Exxon Valdez uh, damage assessment. And your damage, your sort of intervention is to start with a clean slate, which would be equivalent when they sort of spray, they, they hot, hot wash the rocks and yeah. pretty much took everything off. And that, that's sort of your, where you would then come in for intervention. But the other choices, and I know you're not going to, this isn't going to address this, but before you get to that, there's either leaving oil on there, not cleaning it at all, or they did a fertilizer thing, which was supposed to speed up. Mm -hmm. I mean, how would you deal with, I mean, it's sort of a difficult question, but... About making decisions about... Yeah, how would you make there? those decisions? Because what it, whether you intervene or not could also be before you even wash it, before you, you're at the point where you're addressing it, where yeah. your work is going to address the question. Yeah, I think that... Um, I think that you can compare the results from uh, previous, but I think generally uh, it's considered that, that hot washing is just bad, that you, you, sh you shouldn't do it, <laughs> um, and that it is better not, not to, uh, to do that. But I think um, most studies that I've seen have shown that that more than anything was what damaged the, the system. Yeah. 
That's in context, you know, the, it's the valuation of the rate of recovery is, is in large part the valuation of those ecosystem services. If you were to find it, in fact, they didn't want to be precious and look for it. They might have the recovery rate could be an extremely good way to start to spend oil money, right? So if you thought about what the ecosystem services are and how you would value it, how would you value it? Like of uh, muscles? Mm -hmm. Um, gosh, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, there's a lot. Um, and I think the, the, at least as far as the ecological ecosystem services, I think that was, that's really what I'm trying to get at in the first chapter is look at kind of all those things that, that muscles can facilitate. Um, and they, they definitely uh, have an extreme value in, in creating diversity and, and things like that in muscle beds. Um, but I, yeah, I think that it goes way beyond that. I think, I think it's a full subtitle. Ecosystems benefit from a healthy intertidal ecosystems. So there's, there's that and a lot of other things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been this before, but are you aware about the timing of the disturbance in the context of? If a disturbance happens in the middle of the winter, the system is all crazy and big waves, and you can make that the recovery is faster than in summertime. And if you're thinking of the next, I don't know if you have to think of the next. Yeah. More importantly, in the species interactions that you're looking at, if there's data out there, this is a melody of the positive or negative interaction. The seasonality of the interaction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought about that a little bit because you, in the winter you're going to have this heavier uh, stress from waves and storms and things like that. And so you could potentially have these 
gradients and stress between seasons. And I do think that's really interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to that. I, I'm not sure if there's any uh, if there's any data out there or any studies that have looked at that at all. I don't I don't think so. Um, and to start with, I, th I think that that is a, probably an important factor when it actually occurs because it, if a disturbance occurs when you're already getting heavy natural disturbances, then you would get this sort of uh, uh, combined effect of those two things, which could add to the negative effect. Um, but I don't know if there's any data out there for that. But that's, that's definitely something that could get incorporated. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> 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 but it's yeah. fine. The, the results you find from Tapper One are really interesting, especially when these two conversion slopes are the same field. But in the other side, it seemed like there was a big side effect because there were different dynamics. And following up on Rodrigo's question about time, I'm wondering if you can, you showed a, a, a figure showing these long time series of recruitment patterns, I think, from up and down the entire coast. And different sites are going to have different recruitment patterns year to year like, because of this level phase and all the oceanographic conditions. So I'm wondering if maybe you've looked at the standing community, maybe the size classes, what's already there, to get an idea of how temporal that pulse of recruitment may be, or if it's a pretty constant um, rate of recruitment, and how that might influence the efficacy of the uh, transplants and everything in a site that only gets episodic pulses. Yeah, yeah, and that's one thing that might actually be going on at Oculto, because mm -hmm. they're the, the muscles do seem, they're all like the same size. So it seems like they all came from this one big pulse, and then you, and the, the preliminary recruitment data that I processed shows that recruitment is pretty low at, um, at all those sites. Um, for Middle East California, I know that it's not, um, there's, there's not these huge uh, recruitment uh, episodes. It's more consistent uh, over time um, compared to something like Middle East Trostless or Gallup and Chaos. They have more of a kind of surge of recruitment. But um, one of the things in, in that second study where I'm going to go out and do the clearings is that I want to kind of look and see those cohorts of recruits. So I, that is something that I think would be really interesting to explore. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> You're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about the restoration and the feasibility of it. And sometimes we have these natural disturbances which are always on the large scale. So I'm just wondering what you think the feasible, you know, assuming it was possible to do by, I'm not sure of how. Um, you know, what sort of scale is, is it really feasible to think about doing the restoration? I think it might depend on what the, the ultimate strategy ends up being. So the muscle transplant strategy, I think, would only really work for uh, very small scales. Um, it's just, it's really intensive. Um, however, if you could, if you had another kind of strategy, say, where you went out and, um, which I've, I've thought about, just going out and attaching um, some kind of artificial substrate that could facilitate muscle recruits, um, I think that that potentially could be implemented on a pretty large scale. To be, um, uh, yeah, something like that, yeah. But that was, you know, thinking about that, though, was like, well, how can I do this uh, way easier and, and cheaper? <laughs> and then uh, uh, that really got me thinking about that second chapter, which was what actually would facilitate. What? Oh yeah, the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna we're gonna have a celebration of the lab, uh, just as normal. Thanks again.